Back as early as the 1980s, radio scanning in the United States was encouraged and big business, but in the UK, the radio hobby was under constant attack. Scanning in the UK began to emerge following the influx of reasonably priced CB radio equipment from the US in the mid-1970s, but technology then meant that it wasn't really on the radar as a risk. While shortwave listening was tolerated, VHF and UHF scanning was frowned upon and by the early 1990s there were signs appearing to indicate that legislation to ban scanners was being planned. The world of radio scanning is governed by such laws as the Wireless Telegraphy Act, the Interception of Communications Act 1985 and a statutory instrument, which is a regulation and not a law, known as the Wireless Telegraphy Apparatus Receivers Exemption Regulations. Estimates put the number of scanners in the UK at around 250,000 in 1992, yet under British laws, these owners were only legally allowed to listen to 88 to 108 MHz, the various amateur bands and the television band. Outside of these limits, enthusiasts caught listening could either face a £2,000 fine and two years imprisonment under the Interception of Communications Act, or a £5,000 fine and confiscation of all equipment under the Wireless Telegraphy Act, or even worse, both. I get numerous comments on my radio scanning videos that quote many falsehoods regarding the law on radio scanning in the UK. So I thought we'd discuss this at length and give you the whole picture on the law in the UK, despite the fact that we all radio scan, all monitor whatever we can, and that there's shops and websites that sell scanners. Nobody is making a recording of this, but I'll tell you this, you're gonna be dead by Friday. By the 1990s, it seemed that every newspaper, both local and national, was printing stories on the use of radio scanners. Some of them got their facts right, but the majority didn't. For the most part, the stories concentrated on how easy it was to listen to cellular telephone conversations or the emergency services. The problem with all of these stories was that they concentrated on the illegal aspects of scanning and portrayed the hobby as being somewhat seedy. The main problem with eavesdropping was that the services affected had not kept up to date with technology and that the real solution was digital modes or scrambling rather than hoping stricter laws would prevent the use of scanners for criminal intent. Several bodies were becoming growingly concerned about the number of scanners in circulation and their possible use by criminals. It was never common for cases of illegal listening to come to court, most that did were usually in relation to other offences. The often quoted phrase, it's not illegal to listen but it is illegal to act upon or pass anything heard, is not true, it is illegal to listen. One of the reasons this statement has passed into scanning folklore may be because people have only ever tended to have been prosecuted in connection with other offences. You only had to go to an airport, air show, motorsport event and a whole variety of other activities to see a range of scanners in public use. Technically, all of those people were committing an offence, but it was unlikely that any form of prosecution would have taken place unless somebody did something foolish. So, what does the Wireless Telegraphy Act say about general reception radio scanners? Generally, the use of radio receivers is exempt from requiring a licence unless it's also capable of transmission. It is legal to place compliant radio receivers on the market in the UK. It then goes on to explain what a radio scanner is. It then says, typically, receivers and scanners can only be used for general reception, such as licensed broadcasting stations and hobby radio. Ofcom cannot provide specific guidance on legal issues associated with the use of receiving apparatus, and when in doubt, it's recommended that specific legal advice is obtained. There are two criminal offences relating to unauthorised reception, interception and disclosure. See section 48 of the Wireless Telegraphy Act 2006. It's an offence for any unauthorised person to use wireless telegraphy apparatus with intent to obtain information such as contents, sender or addressee of any message, whether sent by means of wireless telegraphy or not, of which neither the person using the apparatus nor the person on whose behalf he is acting is an intended recipient. The Investigatory Powers Act 2016 allows for a number of different organisations to carry out interception of communications and other forms of monitoring. It's an offence for someone, otherwise under the authority of a designated person, to disclose any information as to the content, sender or addressee of any message referred to above. 
However, this does not apply where the disclosure is in the course of legal proceedings, or for the purpose of any report on those proceedings. Furthermore, it does not apply where the information would have come to the person's knowledge without the use of wireless telegraphy apparatus by the person or by anyone else. This means that it's illegal to disclose to a third party anything heard in a transmission that a person has listened to without authorization. The maximum penalty is up to two years imprisonment and or an unlimited fine. In 1993, the DTI Radio Communications Division made it clear that listening to civil aircraft communications was illegal unless permission was granted by the user of the service being monitored. One listener wrote to the Civil Aviation Authority in order to obtain permission, but was told that permission couldn't be granted. However, prosecution would not be carried out against persons who monitor transmissions as part of their hobby, i.e. for no commercial gain. In 1995, Matthew King wrote to the DTI to seek clarification on the law relating to listening to unlicensed broadcasting stations and the use of radio scanners. They said that it wasn't in the agency's policy to comment on individual cases which have been before the courts. However, the position under the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1949 was as follows. Radio receivers used solely for the reception of authorised broadcasting stations were first exempt from licensing on the 1st of April 1971. The exemption did not, however, extend to radio receivers used to receive unauthorised broadcasting stations. On the 27th of February 1989, the use of all radio receiving equipment was exempt from licensing, with the exception of television receivers and receivers used for the purpose of receiving unauthorised broadcasting stations. It has therefore always been the case that it's an offence to receive unlicensed broadcasting stations other than under the authority of a licence. Such licences are not issued. In addition to the licensing aspect, members of the public may only lawfully use radio scanners to listen to radio messages sent for general reception, or for radio messages that the sender has given permission to be received. Messages for general reception include, amongst other things, transmissions by authorised broadcasters, radio amateurs and citizens band radio operators. The unauthorised reception of other radio communications is an offence under Section 5B of the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1949. On conviction, the maximum penalty is a fine of £5,000 and forfeiture of the apparatus. The law relating to the use of radio scanners is fully explained in the agency's information sheet RA169, which can be obtained by telephoning the agency's inquiry post. I can't. There's too much QRM in the background at my place. The emergence of radio scanning directories such as the Confidential Plan in 1989 opened up the eyes of the British government. By the end of the 1980s, they suddenly realised that new technology and the spread of information meant that the police, the military, the government and even the Secret Service communications were being eavesdropped on. The freedoms that both US and Canadian scanner enthusiasts took for granted, such as freely published scanner frequency guides, was something that only appeared on the market in the early 1990s in the UK. This in itself was at great personal risk to both the publisher and the author. 1992 saw Sky News and two major newspapers pick up on the frequencies listed in the UK scanning directory published by Interproducts. The booklet was compiled by Richard Barnes who lived in Perth, Scotland. In December 1992, an advertisement in the UK-based shortwave magazine proudly announced that the British Scanner Guide, a book that contained over 8,000 spot frequencies, was newly available. Terence, the publisher, and former police communications officer, was inundated with orders, but soon noticed his mail had begun to mysteriously drop off. He approached his local mail sorting office for an explanation. He was informed that several bags of his mail had gotten lost. In fact, his mail was being intercepted by his former employers, the police, who also deemed it necessary to tap his phone lines. Two weeks later, a dawn raid on the 18th of January 1993 decimated the stock and equipment of his business premises in Reading. Ten plainclothes policemen, after producing a warrant, seized everything from the company office. The pretext of the raid was that the proprietor was being charged with the theft of a radio, a charge that was subsequently dropped after seven hours of police interrogation. Terence had not broken any laws, as there was no law that banned such publications in the UK, and he had certainly not stolen any radio. During his seven hours of interrogation, several policemen had taken up residence in his office to answer his telephone calls. 
However, rather than take orders for the scanning guide, they spoke under the guise of an accountant and informed callers that Terence had gone bankrupt and the book was no longer available. Within a couple of days of release, customers whose mail had originally gotten lost received a letter from the police. The letter revealed details of an ongoing investigation by the International and Organised Crime Division of New Scotland Yard into Terence's business and implied that the British scanner guy did not exist and was merely a ploy to cheat customers out of their money. Not surprisingly, the customers who had allegedly been cheated were the same customers whose mail had disappeared. Accompanying the letter was a witness statement form, which recipients were requested to fill in and sign, and these were to be used as evidence in Terence's trial. In a final act, Terence was charged on the 28th of January 1993 with obtaining property and money under false pretenses, and impersonating a police officer. However, one fact remained, the British Scanner Guide was available for sale, and many customers did receive their ordered copy. It seems likely that the Metropolitan Police were just pawns in a conspiracy, and were taking their orders from a higher power, who some believe to be MI5 operating on behalf of a government policy, yet to be passed into law, that sought to ban scanning in the UK. There's a lot of trouble tonight, uh, some rather funny stuff coming up, and uh, there's some uh, any, uh, big idiot putting up a carrier on top of it, but uh, there we are anyway. Uh, the Baker Street robbery was a burglary of safety deposit boxes at the Baker Street branch of Lloyds Bank in London on the night of the 11th of September 1971. The gang's radio communications were intercepted by Robert Rowlands, who, after some persuasion, managed to get the police to believe his story and attend. After the end of the investigation, Scotland Yard considered prosecuting Rowlands under the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1967 for listening to unlicensed transmissions, but no charges were laid against him. Shortly after the court case, Lloyds Bank sent him a cheque for £2,500 to thank him for his actions. March 1991 saw a story in the Southampton Evening Echo regarding what they called a CB radio enthusiast who was operating from his car whilst parked at a local high spot. The police noticed that he had a scanner in the back of his car, which was seized and taken back to headquarters for examination. The scanner was found to be programmed with police frequencies, aircraft frequencies and what was described as a home office channel. The case later went to court and he was found guilty of obtaining information which he was not authorised to receive, the end result being a six month conditional discharge. The article didn't state whether the scanner was switched on at the time, or if the transmissions were being rebroadcast over the CB channels, something that was quite common. Hello Alex, it's MCR if you can hear us. Alex, you there? Sound? Uh, uh, hello, Alex. According to a Plymouth Evening newspaper, schoolboy Michael Bellamy had all of his radio equipment confiscated as a result of a police raid in 1992. The police were acting on the basis of a tip-off and were particularly concerned about a frequency list that was in his possession. Can you hold it just about there? Can you just fly um, uh, slightly north, please, uh, Tom? Uh, the Inverness Courier reported a story of an attempted break-in at a golf club by two men in May 1993. They triggered the alarm and ran off, but when the police arrived, they followed the footprints the men had left in the freshly fallen snow. After a couple of miles, they found them hiding under a bridge, and one of them had a radio scanner, but the batteries had gone flat. During the court case, the defence made the point that the whole escapade was a non-starter in terms of getting away with it, but that they wouldn't have been caught so easily if the receiver had been working. One of the men pleaded guilty for using a scanning receiver, with the intent to obtain information for which he was not authorised. The Leicester Mercury reported a story that same month on the arrest of five radio amateurs in Warrington, not far from me, so if any of you are watching, please get in touch. Their crime was arriving at a particular location after the police had transmitted an all-points bulletin regarding the crash of a UFO in the area. The site was the old Royal Navy airfield at Stretton, and they claimed a UFO was burning on the ground. Of course, there was no UFO crash, and it was just a ploy to entice illegal radio scanner listeners to the area. Two stories were printed in November of 1993. One was at the Kilmarnock County Sheriff Court, where a youth was fined several hundred pounds and his scanner ordered to be destroyed. The reason wasn't made clear. The other case was in Manchester, and involved a man who was fined £200 and £30 costs. 
A policeman said, quote, We prosecuted a scanner whaler on my patch last year, when the Wally turned up at a shout. Unfortunately for him, he's known to us anyway, so when he failed to give a reasonable excuse for coincidentally turning up, his car was searched and two handheld scanners found. Most unfortunately for Mr Scanman, when the officer turned it on, he could hear his mates just down the road dealing with the incident. And when, out of curiosity, he twiddled another knob, the radio room at Scotland Yard burst forth. Now, this is a weird one. Scotland Yard? They met police headquarters in Manchester. Something doesn't quite ring true there. All stations, all stations, all stations. This is Liverpool Coast Guard. Liverpool Coast Guard. Liverpool Coast Guard. The Harrow Observer reported on Colin Clark, who was fined £1,000 and ordered to pay a further £500 investigation and prosecution costs by Harrow Magistrates Court in January 1995. He was stopped in his car by police and radio investigation officers who found his scanner switched off but tuned to a local FM pirate station, which at the time was subject to their investigations. He admitted listening to the pirate station, but considered that operating a radio receiver in a dedicated broadcast band was not really an offence, let alone one that would incur a substantial fine. June 1995 saw a story of a man named Duncan, who was prosecuted a number of years prior for having mobile telephone frequencies in his scanner as well as police channels. He was 17 at the time. Good rig, Jason. Can't beat him. Since about. What do you think of that thing? The West Britain of the 16th of January 1997 ran a story regarding the prosecution of two scanner users. The pair were noticed driving around in a manner described as suspicious. Police stopped their vehicle and a scanner was found under the passenger seat tuned into police channels. They were each given a conditional discharge for a year and ordered to pay prosecution costs. Both admitted to listening to police transmissions that they weren't authorised to receive. The Worcester Evening News printed a story in April 1997 about a mother who was worried about her son's drug habit and decided to use a scanner to listen in on mobile phones in the hope of catching the dealer. The story spoke about a scanner which contained 210 channels, 56 of which were programmed with police frequencies and 14 with mobile phone frequencies. This earned her a 12-month conditional discharge and £50 worth of costs. It's alleged she bought the radio at a car boot sale for £50. It didn't say how she was caught. A scanner owner was apprehended by police while listening in a lay-by in his car in August 1997. Further inspection revealed that the scanner contained 15 police channels and it went to court. He was charged under the Wireless Telegraphy Act and fined £800 plus costs and the Crown Prosecution Service asked for the equipment to be destroyed. Interestingly, the scanner was apparently switched off at the time of police seizure, which contradicts the first line of this story. I thought I'd save this most interesting case until last. A number of interesting incidents took place in 1983. Firstly, someone who was studying for the RAE and who had bought a commercial transceiver was prosecuted by British Telecom, apparently just for installing the radio. Now, if this was a general case, it would have made half the Class B licences in the country at that time outside the law for owning HF rigs from which they transverted. It probably also rendered a good number of Class A amateurs in the same boat, since they no doubt owned gear which could be used outside the amateur bands. This brings us on to the story of Michael John Craven, again another local, so if you're watching this please get in touch. He was prosecuted in mid-1983 for installing an amateur transceiver under section 1-1 of the Wireless Telegraphy Act 1949. Michael, from Disley in Cheshire, pleaded guilty to installing an ICOM 720A transceiver at Macclesfield Magistrates Court. To obtain a conviction under Section 1.1 of the Wireless Telegraphy Act, the prosecution had to prove three things. One, that he installed the radio. Two, that he installed it for wireless telegraphy. And three, that he was not in possession of a licence. He was fined £75, with £25 costs. After the case, he said that his equipment was used purely for listening purposes, and that it even disabled the transmit function. In 1984, the RSGB entered into this whole Class B and Class A argument about the legality of using transceivers for listening only. It said that it was perfectly legal, providing the transmit function was not used, and that the confusion was generated by that section 1-1 of the Act, which made it an offence to establish or use any station or wireless for wireless telegraphy without a licence, since the abolition of the licence for receiving broadcast transmissions. 
However, Regulation 3 of the Wireless Telegraphy, Broadcast Charges and Exemption Regulations of 1970 made it legal to install or use sets for receiving broadcast and amateur transmissions without a licence. The exemption made no reference to the capabilities of the apparatus used, and it didn't prohibit the use of transceivers, but rather the transmission of signals. So, how did Michael John Craven come to be fined in court if he was only listening? How did the DTI even know about this install? Maybe he was also transmitting. There's obviously more to this story like all of the others, but it's now 40 years ago. In 90% of all the stories relating to cases where criminals were caught in the act of monitoring police transmissions, the scanner had often been bought or stolen from places like Tandy. It was argued that if scanners were sold to hobbyists only, by specialist dealers under some sort of license system, the illegal aspect may have been reduced, something I think is complete rubbish. Permits were available for the reception of aircraft and maritime communications, but weren't normally granted to individuals for hobby purposes. I also found that shops that sold scanners were required to keep a list of details of who was buying them. You must know me fairly well. One method used for disguising the fact you were listening to a police scanner was to drill a small hole in the back of the plastic case of the scanner over the chip that held the memories. If you saw the police approaching, you'd pop a nail in the hole and bang the radio on a wall or hard surface, sending the nail through the chip and therefore destroying any evidence. So that's everything I have on UK radio scanning and the law in the UK. If you have any other stories, then feel free to let me know in the comments or drop me an email. Yes, they don't like it, do they? They turned up in Peugeots and they went away in ambulances. Oh my God, they turned up. They turned up and they bust all these pirate radio stations around Brom and with no trouble whatsoever. And then they turned up to see me. You'll notice they've not come back, you know. I mean, wonder why they've not bothered to come back, you know. What is it? Fear? This is a cruel... Absolutely superb. It's sort of fairly commonplace these days, you know, to people.